uh, welcome to um, to this uh, event um, in conjunction with the, with the value of walls. Um, I'm in Cairo, and I'm also joined by three uh, of the artists who participated in the show. Uh, we were, I, I'd like to think of ourselves as a collective of, uh, of five members, and um, all of the discussions and, every, and and this entire project wouldn't have really been without um, without without this collaboration. Um, it it only makes it worth it when um, when we are able to share some of these discussions with everyone. And I think when in when we were considering um, um, uh, the, some of the notions or things that brought us together, the one of the philosophers that came to my mind was obviously Graham Harmon. Uh, Graham Harmon, I knew of him when I was at university in, in Cairo. I didn't have a chance to 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 be one of his students, but um, I, I think an event like this would kind of um, uh, compensate in a way. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Harmon, for accepting to to, to be with us today. Uh, it really is uh, an honor. For me, it's just making me homesick. I want to come back to Egypt. <laughs> um, I'll just pull up. Um... I'll pull up some images from the show that we may that we might um, turn to during our discussion. Um, Maybe what we can start with is a few questions just related to the context of the show in general and its relationship broadly with, with object-oriented ontology and why it is that, that this school of thought was actually relevant for us. Um, and then some of the artists actually have their own questions as well. And maybe in the end, we can open it up to, to the audience um, and, 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 and enlarge the conversation. Great. Great. Um, so if, if I could phrase it very, uh, very simply, object-oriented ontology is a contemporary school of thought that is somewhat suspicious of an anthropocentric view uh, of the world. Uh, for, for triple O, uh, human subjectivity doesn't really hold a privileged perspective onto the world. Rather, um, an object can be anything. It can be us humans. It could be capitalism. It could be the computer that we're using. It could also be the exhibition that we that we that we were thinking that we that we installed a few weeks ago. Um, objects for triple O philosophers are not reducible to how humans view them or how or how humans tend to represent them. Um, and then if we look. Uh, into art history, we'll find that in the 20th century, many artists began to also consider objects differently. And I'm thinking of, um, of Marcel Duchamp and, and his ready-mates. Um, and so one question that I, that, that I had in mind was if already there's been something in art that has taken us outside of the realm of representation, what makes triple O relevant for art today? And, and why, why, where does your interest as 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 an object oriented ontologist how does that relate to to aesthetics really the central idea of object oriented ontology is that philosophy is not a form of knowledge oftentimes philosophy is seen as just the most general form of knowledge but if you go back to plato's dialogues you're going to find that socrates is always the one who says he knows nothing he asks for definitions of terms like friendship and virtue and love and justice, but he never comes up with any definitions. And so I think under the influence of the modern scientific revolution, there's been this false picture of philosophy as a kind of knowledge. And what Triple O is about is about the fact that an object is irreducible to any form of knowledge, yeah. which puts it on the side of aesthetics more. And just to give you a, a broader look at this, um, if somebody asks you what something is, there are basically two kinds of answers you can give and only two. You can tell them what it's made of, or you can tell them what it does. So you're either reducing a thing downward to its parts or its historical genesis, or you're reducing it upward to the effects that it has on other things. Triple O is a way of trying to get at the object itself, which is in between those two. And hence, it's not entirely accessible to literal language, because literal language always either reduces the thing downward or upward by talking about its qualities or its relations to other things. And some people would ask, then how do you say anything about the object? Well, there are lots of ways we say things that are indirect. Language is filled with illusion and hint and innuendo. Um, and art does this as well. Art is not primarily a form of knowledge. If you try to paraphrase an artwork in prose terms, you're not quite going to get it right. 
And uh, so Triple O and the arts are natural allies in that way, kind of allies against literalism. But then the other thing that's important in Triple O is that the object is also in conflict with itself because of this critique of literalism. So uh, uh, David Hume, the famous Scottish philosopher of the 1700s, uh, used to say there isn't really an object called apple because it's just a bundle of qualities. There's just red, round, hard, juicy, cold, spherical. And those qualities go together so often that we introduce the word apple as a kind of nickname for all those qualities. But the object is nothing more than its qualities. And if the qualities change, then it's technically a different object. Whereas phenomenology in the 20th century uh, flipped that around and said, no, we have an access to the object so that even if the qualities of the object are changing, we recognize it's still the same object. So there's this strange tension within the object itself between the object and its own qualities. And within certain limits, it can gain and lose those qualities. And an artwork, in a sense, is a creation of an object that is not paraphrasable, that is not uh, replaceable by any list of qualities. It's always somewhat mysterious. The, the uh, Aesthetics is the realm of the mysterious. It's not the only realm of the mysterious, but it's one of the primary ones. And I guess the biggest difference between uh, Triple O and what Duchamp is doing is that Duchamp, it's a, with ready-mades, it's about the um, incongruous relationship between the ready-made and the art context, because no one is going to be shocked by seeing a urinal in a men's bathroom. Somehow it's supposed to be shocking that you see it in an art gallery, but there's really nothing going on in the ready-mades about a conflict of the object with itself. It's purely the object plus its context, which is, is one way of, of creating an aesthetic effect. Heidegger wrote about this in his philosophy, uh, the strangeness of certain equipment that breaks or that's out of context. But Triple O is really more focused on the conflict in the heart of the object itself. So uh, that, that would be my answer to your first question. Um, is it, this is just, it's getting me to think about, about, about something else. If the object is, does the artist play a role in, in, in highlighting that tension, the, the tension that you, that you, that you noted between an object being the quality of the object being in conflict with the object itself. Does does is is the artist kind of ushering that attention, and is that and then that tension becomes the source of the artwork itself? Uh, some artists are especially good at this. Although ultimately, for me, what's important is the spectator, because the artist needs to succeed in bringing about an aesthetic experience in the spectator. And in a sense, I see the artist as just an especially well-informed spectator. Um, because you can create an artwork, but if it's simply viewed by three-year-olds, they're not going to get it as art, as art, probably, unless it's a very simple kind. It's Coyotes and rabbits are not going to grasp the artwork in most cases. And so for the artwork to occur as an artwork, it needs to be encountered by others, including the artist, who have an aesthetic experience rather than a literal, literal experience when confronting it. And so in a sense, the, the spectator has to perform in their own minds the absence of the object, the difference of the object from its own literal qualities. Um, so, this yes. no, I beg no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger are two philosophers who want to privilege the standpoint of the artist rather than the spectator. And Nietzsche in particular is very vehement about this, but he never really nails the argument down uh, what it is he means about that. Uh, obviously, he views the artist as a superior human, and I have no particular problem with that. Um, I think aesthetic vision is a true form of genius, but ultimately, uh, it has to be something that is accessible to the, the spectator or the beholder, as Michael Fried calls it. So I'm I'm very much on that side of it. Well, that actually gets me to think about some of the peculiarities of producing the show, um, this project. Um, so the artists have been coming to the apartment where the exhibition is taking place for the past two years. Before that, the, the apartment was abandoned for another 22 years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it all started with Nata Baraka, who is actually the former minister's granddaughter, um, was asking herself questions about the apartment. Um, and then she was joined by the other artists. And I mean, she's one who actually brought us all together. But there was constantly a sense as we were working in the apartment of unfamiliarity. Um, mm -hmm. So even though the apartment contained houseware objects that we all that we're all familiar with, like furniture, decorative items, or even an archive of letters and and photography, um, it was still somewhat strange for all of us. 
And I was wondering if um, whether that unfamiliarity kind of prepared for what you uh, uh, point as a non-relational relation to the objects in the apartment, in the sense that um, we didn't come seeking the, the effects that these objects would have on us, but rather it was um, it was more of an innocent um, a coming together of between us as participants and the objects in the apartment as other participants. And in that sense, it also brings me to ask whether non whether the non-relational is a condition for producing art. I would say that the non-literal is a uh, condition for producing art. The non-relational I would see as a, spe a species of the non-literal. And I don't think that relations are bad the way that traditional formalists do. So a traditional formalist would say that the socio-political context of a work is irrelevant, that the biography of the artist is irrelevant. I wouldn't go that far. I would say that uh, an artwork simply needs to be cut off from a large number of relations. So you can have relational art, but it's usually art that highlights just a few of the relations of the artwork. So especially in architecture, for example, obviously architecture by definition is site specific. It's always designed for a certain site. Uh, but when, when my students at SciArc talk about how site specific their building designs are, they're always only focusing on three or four or five aspects of the site while ignoring others. You can't have an artwork that responds to all aspects of the site in some kind of pure holism because then the entire universe would be an artwork and that's not how reality works. Things are always partially cut off from each other. And I think an artwork has to at least whittle down the relations an object has to a limited finite number. And there's a couple of things going on in this case. I love I love the project behind this artwork, by the way. Uh, one thing is that I'm familiar with this building. I'm not familiar with this apartment, of course. I didn't know it was there, but I've been in that building. I had a friend my first few years of teaching at Cairo who lived in that building. I was shocked when I saw the address on the screen. Uh, so I remember the street very clearly. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, it was sealed off for, you said, 21 years, which yes. means there's there's probably an archaic historical effect when you go in, that it's a, an apartment of, at most, the early 21st century. And if he was old, he probably tended to have an already old style at the time of his death. And so this, presumably this apartment might be decorated in the style of the 1980s or something. And there's always a, uh, an aesthetic effect when you're talking about old stuff, historical stuff, because you're entering unfamiliar surroundings. Uh, and since the the use value of those things is now out of date, their aesthetic effect, their non-relational effect comes out. So those are a couple of thoughts. Um, ushering in new relations amongst objects is one way of defamiliarizing objects and taking them out of their literal use. So um, I remember seeing um, uh, Jeff Kuhn's vacuum cleaner when I was getting a lecture at the Stockholm Museum of Modern Art. I don't remember what year the vacuum cleaner was from. He simply bought a vacuum cleaner from a department store and put it in a glass case. And whenever he did that, it's now a, an out of date vacuum cleaner. And so it's taken on a historical quality. It's like seeing an old telephone or an old laptop or something. And the mere fact of being out of its original historical context gives a certain aesthetic feel to it, just like with antique cars. And if you go to a place like Damascus or Havana that has a lot of old cars that are nicely maintained, you, there's an automatic aesthetic effect just from that. Uh, of course, the quality of light in a place can have an aesthetic effect. For me, Alexandria was a place where I would go often when I was teaching at AUC, simply because the light was so special. Uh, everything looked like a Technicolor film in Alexandria. And uh, I would just stare at taxis up there because the colors were so pretty. Uh, and so there are many different ways to make things unfamiliar or make them just a little bit off. Um, the relations may be contingent, but I think contingency is in a way too popular these days. Um, you know, there's been a lot of attention to found objects, but there's always a reason you're choosing certain objects rather than others. Um, you might find a lot of objects, but you're probably picking one in particular. So there's something in between necessity and contingency that I think the artist is working with. Um, even if there's a, a, an element of randomness involved in an artwork, there's still that selective faculty going on. The artist is still going to be canceling out certain things that don't work. And so I'm, I'm suspicious to some extent of, of pure contingency as you find in Mayasu's philosophy and in certain um, theories of art. Did I miss any part of your question? No, not at all. Okay. Um, 
I was actually thinking that this might be a good way to lead us into talking about Nada, Nada Baraka's um, an Epoch of Grace, which happens in the kitchen. Um, but it happens through um, it, it happens through sort of a defamiliarization of the kitchen itself. And I think what's right. interesting is that even though the kitchen is something that is the most familiar to all of us, and that includes us as the, the participants in the exhibition, especially Nanda herself, but all, and also the visitors, it you know it it, it she turned it into something very different. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if maybe you might want to. Um, I don't know what to say exactly about the kitchen. It was a, it was a very spont—I can't say spontaneous experience, but it was. Uh, uh, it took a couple of months to understand, like the whole the, the kitchen itself and, and and the use of the kitchen and and how I can see the object uh, in a different form and what the apartment and the kitchen is giving me in the sense that I do work related to the kitchen and how they they can. Um, make a conversation together, but at the same time, I keep the quality of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, um, as a philosopher, and like I feel like that the way you, you put or you explain art and, and objects is very important in, in this sense is that I try to create something that is object-based, that is also, that it still has its own quality, but at the same time, um, I try to build my own experience. Um, I don't know how relevant it is. I think they were talking about also being so let's stop on it and leave some odd objects behind and let's like can you like explain a little bit more about how you do that like, for, for this um session? yeah I, I think what was also very exciting is that it took us months to go through what was in the apartment so being able to classify what I wanted to use in the kitchen was actually interesting because it, it was related to my work in a sense I I love to paint kitchens and like haunted houses and rooms and so I felt like I would treat I would try to treat this space as an as a painting but but an installation or like an object based experience. Um, so I think my choices came from this experience as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's a disorienting kitchen, still recognizable as a kitchen. And to me it's recognizable as a regular garden city kitchen. It brings back nostalgia. And but see, you've kept it within certain bounds, right? You haven't made it unrecognizable as a kitchen. So you've set yourself certain limits, which I think is appropriate. And uh, there's something important going on here. Um, Aristotle, back in the Poetics, when he was talking about metaphor, made the point that a metaphor can't contain too many surprises, or it becomes a riddle instead of a metaphor. He gives this example of, I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire. And you read that and you think, what? And it turns out that is a reference to the ancient Greek medical technique of cauterizing somebody's wound with hot metal. And he said, if you describe that as I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire, then again, you have a riddle. You don't have a metaphor. And so a metaphor needs a certain amount of literal ballast. It's as though humans need a certain amount of reassuring familiarity in order to be willing to accept something unsettling or strange um, connected to it. Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media theorist, uh, when he first sent his book, Understanding Media, to a publisher, the publisher replied that the problem with your book is it's 90% new. A successful book should only be 10% new. And uh, I guess in art, the analogy for this would be that if you had an artwork that was completely without precedent, it would be almost illegible to the art worlds, right? So you, it's important to uh, be familiar with the most important artwork in the generation before yours and to do something surprising with that or to step in a slightly different direction from that. But I always try to imagine, like, I think we can all appreciate this as an artwork, but would Rembrandt have been able to appreciate this as an artwork? Certainly not. There are too many steps between his time and ours. And this points to the way in which art is historical. That surprises, aesthetic surprises build on each other over time. And we're always in a dialogue with other artists or other philosophers. So you, you have to prepare people um, by containing some familiar elements in your arts while also uh, a few unfamiliar elements. And I think you've done that very nicely here uh, by not violating the constraint that it's a kitchen. Uh, we're just finding unfamiliar objects in the freezer and elsewhere. 
Uh, and so we we think we're encountering a familiar kitchen and suddenly, uh, wow, what is this? Now, it would have been more Dada if it were an instantly recognizable object. Like, let's say you had a, I don't know, a, a statue of a rhinoceros in there or something. That would be more Dada or surrealist. But this is something inscrutable. It looks like it's either junk or it's some kind of strange machine pieced together out of junk. And so the mind is occupied here and trying to figure out what this is. It doesn't look like randomness. It looks like a strange piece of equipment. How would you describe it? Um, I think you, you explained it very well uh, because uh, I didn't want to, the audience to see uh, like a familiar, like I wanted the familiar, but I also wanted the mystery. So I tried to break the parts uh, apart and I tried to, let, again, let the kitchen talk to me. So I kept, like the whole experience was all about the process and trying different uh, materials and elements and seeing how it will end up. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely, I didn't want anything that is too familiar, but at the same time, I wanted, like you said, to keep the essence of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, it came also very organically. Like uh, I actually removed everything out of the kitchen and then I put them back together. So I felt like I can't take the kitchen out of it, but I, I can do something that can work together and also like cause a conversation like make you think uh, what does the kitchen say, what's inside the fridge, why are there art artworks in it? So this mm -hmm. is what I was trying to do. <laughs> yes, and it looks like there's writing on the inside of the freezer door. Yes. Did you, did you put that? Yes. Um, okay. So those are different. Uh, my grandfather collected when he was traveling um, in different places and also uh, a lot of the drawings and paintings uh, are uh, are doodles that he like or like notes that he kept. I felt like it would be nice uh, to make a conversation with my grandfather as well and to mm -hmm. keep his effort. So, All right. So I, I think this is an installation that has the right amount of mystery to it, and uh, that successfully combats literalism. It's it's not a ready-made, right? Because it's it's not about just taking a familiar object and putting it in an unfamiliar context. It's about uh, creating something that comes off as a unified piece of technology, but has no obvious literal function or even literal composition. So I, I think this, this thing in the refrigerator, whatever it is, uh, succeeds in being what Kant would call purposiveness without purpose. It looks like it has a purpose, but we fail to find any literal purpose for it. While all in framed by a freezer, a regular item of equipment that we're very accustomed to. So there's a nice contrast there. If the um, freezer were also confusing, if the freezer were also ambiguous, it would be, become too confusing. So you have, in other words, I, I, I think you did hear what McLuhan's publisher said you should do, which is, You've got an unfamiliar object framed by a familiar one. It makes it easier for the mind to go along with it. So it's kind of reverse data. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I actually, this, this the, um, I was kind of think, thinking about one term that we're constantly using when we're talking about what the artist did in the show, we talk about in terms of the intervention. But I wonder if maybe another term that is more suitable might be a reconstruction. In the sense that an intervention are, presumes a form of an ownership. Mm -hmm. Who owns what in the, is the art, I mean, the artist has some form of an ownership. Whereas if it is a reconstruction, there is somewhat more of a balance between the artist's presence in the show and, and, and the artworks and the, the objects that they're actually working with. Reconstruction is an interesting idea. I, the first thing I think of is sometimes when an airplane crashes, they reassemble all the pieces they found in a hangar to try to figure out what went wrong, where the explosion was. And there's something always hauntingly aesthetic about those photos to me, even, when, even though many people have always died in those cases. There's something very ghostly about seeing an airplane almost reconstructed with a hole in the side where the bomb went off or the gas tank exploded. And um, in the last year, I published an article on shipwrecks. 
and uh, how shipwrecks, in a sense, get us closer to the real nature of the ship than the ship itself did. Um, that somehow by stripping away uh, unnecessary detail, maybe I should should give the context for that. There's an old po uh, paradox in philosophy called the ship of Theseus. Um, you know, Theseus was the Greek hero who, who killed the Minotaur that was menacing Greece. And uh, in honor of Theseus, they would send a ship to an island every year to make a sacrifice in his name. And the paradox goes like this, um, that every year, say, one of the pieces of the wood on Theseus's ship is rotting, and so they replace it with a new piece of wood. And then over time, they, re they replace another piece of wood and another piece of wood. And then finally, none of the original wood pieces are there. So is it still the ship of Theseus? And then another variation on that is that some, as they replace each of these rotten pieces of wood, someone is taking all the rotten wood and then reassembling them into a, a new ship of Theseus. So at the end, you have one ship of Theseus that's made of all the rotten wood that was taken from the original one and reassembled in a ship form. And then you've got this other ship that is, I guess, the real ship of Theseus, but that's been replaced by all new wood. And so the debate is always, which of those ships is the real ship of Theseus? And there's, there's a big philosophical debate about this. And some people say there's actually two ships instead of one now. Whereas my uh, critique of this in this article was that what both of those solutions presume is that you need to preserve detail to keep the thing, right? That either you're trying to preserve the actual wood pieces or you're trying to preserve the shape. Whereas I think in a way, what you're trying to do is, is lose it. Um, that uh, if you're looking at a person's life, you're not trying to save all the details of their life. You're trying to, to look for certain patterns, uh, look at the person in different situations, maybe the person reacting in opposite ways to similar phenomena at different parts of their life. And so you're trying to look at something that's deeper than any specific moment of their life. And in a way, I think with the ship, a shipwreck, what it allows us to do is kind of get rid of a lot of the detail. And so if you're looking at the Titanic underwater, which led to another accident this year, um, there's something about the Titanic underwater on the ocean floor split into pieces that's more real than the Titanic at the top. You're able to see more essential features of it somehow uh, just by looking at what survived. Um, and I think archaeology gives us a lot of this, right? That archaeology, in a way, the virtue of archaeology is that it cannot get too much information. That if you, if archaeologists could restore the building completely to how it was, it would become a form of history or even of journalism. Whereas archaeologists only get certain basic features of an old city that have survived. And in a way, that's more useful. It allows us to make more, more useful generalizations instead of focusing on the details of a, a building. You can ask broader questions like, did these people know how to make pottery yet? No. Um, what was the, did these people have coins yet? No. Did these people have domestic animals? Yes. You can ask those kinds of very basic questions when you're forced to look at the most abstract features of an archaeological site. And I think the same is often true uh, in the arts. Um, this is, I think this is why ar archaeology is sometimes more illuminating than history, even though it has fewer details to offer us and fewer certainties to offer us. It can offer a basic sequence of events in terms of which millennium a certain thing probably happened in. And so I think... Uh, yeah, you know, in the case of the shipwreck, that's true. And I think also in the case of art, sometimes uh, having less detail is what McLuhan called a cold medium. It's more hypnotic to have less detail, to have less of the work done for you as a spectator. And have to have to provide a lot of the story yourself. It's very hypnotic that way. Like fire. Why is fire so hypnotic? Because there's so little information. Um, you know, you can get engrossed in a book, but you can really get engrossed staring at a fireplace. I remember my six month old nephew just staring at the fire for 45 minutes without blinking. It's the most fascinating thing there is. And actually speaking of those uncertainties, the the unknown played a very important role in the exhibition for us, either as a, as a theme or what motivated our, rela our relationship to the, the apartment and the project itself. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it, it comes out very clearly in some of Muhammad and Mahrabi's works, actually even the title of, of all three of his projects is an unknown instrument. Um, in, at one point he talks about the facticities of this unknown instrument. Another point he talks about the physiology and in the last one he talks about the phantasma and this unknown instruments as a phantasmagoria. Uh, so he's reimagining the technical drawings of the high dam 
as as, um, as a creature, you know, as a life, as, as a living creature. And what, um, in all three of these iterations, the medium that allows this to happen is drawing, but then he always adds a parameter, an optical parameter onto these drawings that kind of distances us from, um, from the artwork itself or from the creature that we, that we are kind of trying to discover. And my question was, could, is it possible to, to stage the unknown? And, and what does, what, what is the role of an artist then for an object oriented ontologist if he's not, if he's not a creator? Oh, I think the artist is a creator. Although I think the artist is often creating by compounding pre-existent objects. At least that's one way to do it. Uh, the Aswan Dam, of course, is a very interesting case. I think of Abu Simbel, which I got to visit during my first year in Egypt, and the way it's it's in a totally different location, higher up than it was. They had to do that to save it. Then, of course, I think they tilted it slightly at the right angle, so the sun rises the sun shines through the crack one day earlier or one day later than it's supposed to because they made a slight engineering mistake, but they've decontextualized one of the great ancient monuments. One of the most impressive things that visitors to Egypt are amazed by when they come is Abu Simbel. And um, so that's, uh, that's one way the aesthetic can work. You can move a thing slightly out of its natural place or more than slightly um, in terms of staging or creating the unknown object, certainly. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. Sometimes the title is enough. Um, you can you can take a fairly ordinary thing and just change it with the title. Well, I guess Fountain, in the case of Duchamp's Urinal, is one, one such example. But I, I'm always entertained by uh, Dali's painting, The Flaming Giraffe. And if you know, if you know or don't know that painting, it's has his usual surrealist imagery and you have no idea why it's called the flaming giraffe and then eventually you notice that in the distant left background there's this flaming giraffe that it takes you a while to notice and it's, it's just amusing that that's the title but um one one artist i've written about a lot and here we're talking about literature is hp lovecraft the american horror and science fiction writer and one of the ways that lovecraft um stages the unknown is that he he does what seems to be a cliche of horror writing. He'll start off by saying, this object was so horrifying that there's no way I could describe it, which is something hack horror writers do. But then he says, however, it will be a cliche to say that no human pen could describe it. And then he goes on to try to describe it. So he, he says in one example, uh, this, this, this monstrous creature dies on a library floor and starts to decay. And he says, while it would be trite to say that no human pen could describe it, let us say that uh, anyone too bound up with the known life forms of Earth and its three-dimensional geometries would have a difficulty in processing this experience. So he doesn't quite just say no human pen could describe it. He sort of says that and says, but that's a cliche. So let's try to describe it a bit anyway. And then he gives this impossible description. Uh, and this is what makes him one of the things that makes Lovecraft so effective as a writer and so much better than the run of the mill horror writer is his, um, for instance, he says uh, certain characters were swallowed up by an angle that was acute, but behaved as if it were obtuse. So what would that mean that an angle is one kind of angle, but it actually behaves as if it were a different kind of angle? There's something very frightening about that, that if you see a, if you see an acute angle, you expect to be able to hide in the cozy corner, but then it actually behaves as if it were obtuse. So you think you're getting into this cozy angle, but then you slide out of it. That's, he probably meant something like that. That's one way of staging the unknown in literature. You, you have different tools in the visual arts because you can't use language like that. You can't just posit contradictions like that. So um, the way it was done in architecture originally, ironically, is in gardening by the Chinese. Uh, the British travelers to China in the late 1600s, early 1700s, this is probably the origin of European Romanticism. The Chinese excelled at making gardens that were rather mysterious, as opposed to the French geometrical gardens that had dominated in Europe, like Versailles, where everything's at perfect angles and makes geometrical shapes. The Chinese had all these techniques, like um, they'd have a lake in the garden, but they'd make sure the end of the lake was behind a mountain, so you couldn't see it, so it seemed like the lake was infinite. You seem to be creating an infinite lake. They would put a uh, 
tunnel of rushing water under the footpath so you could hear rumbling water from somewhere. You had no idea where it was. They would stage certain trees to make it look as if they'd been struck by lightning. They would put rotting windmills slowly rotating to add a sense of motion and also mystery. And so there are a lot of techniques you can use uh, in architecture as well as the visual arts to stage the unknown. And this is, um, I guess some people would say Duchamp is simply staging the known and creating a clash between a known object and its context. And again, I, I have nothing against that. I'm, I'm not on the side of traditional formalism and denouncing Duchamp by any means. Uh, at the very least, he helped bring a sense of humor into art that's still around. Maybe that's been overblown, but overdone. But um, so it, that's a long way to answer your question that I think art creates a hybrid object where you have an unknown object combined with known qualities. So the qualities are familiar, but they are maybe shuffled around in a new order and the underlying object to which they belong is unfamiliar. And I don't think that's anything specific to the 20th or 21st century. I think this is already how metaphor works, a very ancient art form, where when Homer says the wine dark sea, when he, he's not just saying, hey, have you noticed that the Mediterranean is roughly the same color as a bottle of wine? No, that's not what he's saying. He's using that surface similarity as an excuse to insinuate deeper resonances between the Mediterranean and wine, like mystery, darkness, intoxication, danger, forgetfulness. And you, as the reader of the poem, have to perform that because we don't know what a wine-like sea would be. I mean, a sea like wine, sorry, yeah, wine-like sea. We know, we know what wine qualities are. We all have some familiarity with what wine is like and how it affects people. And so those qualities are not mysterious, but their attachment to us, to the Mediterranean Sea, is what's mysterious to us. And we have to perform that difference. And that's why I think all art is ultimately performance art, uh, that you, the spectator has to live that mystery. If they don't, if you have an animal or a small child or someone with no aesthetic appreciation encountering your work, it's not really an artwork for them. Uh, I believe that if all humans were exterminated, there wouldn't really be artworks, you know, unless, unless some dolphins are capable of appreciating artworks. I don't know. Necessary ingredients of an artwork, just like humans are a necessary ingredient of society. But that doesn't mean that art or society are just what humans think they are, right? Because we're part of society, but we don't really understand society. Not even the best sociologist in the world understands society. I would say the creator of an artwork doesn't even know what the artwork means. An artwork should be partially a mystery even to the artist. And sure, the artist can say more intelligent things about the artwork usually than a random person can, but sometimes a critic uh, has more to say about an artwork than the artist does. Um, the artist isn't required to speak intelligently about their work. They've already done their job once they've created it. Some artists write better about their work than others. You know, Cezanne writes very well about his work. Other artists, not so well. So Van Gogh also writes well about his work, but not everybody does, and they don't need to, because the artist is not translating a prose meaning into symbols. They're doing something different. And, um, speaking of, of metaphor, um, we have one work in the, in the exhibition. Um, it belongs to Henny Roshit. Uh, who's not with us um, today. Uh, the work is called Land of Hypocrisy. It consists yeah. of, part, uh, of a cabinet filled with jars, and each of those jars contains um, uh, things that are related to, to, to the environment, either rocks, um, soil, um, seeds, um, plants, um, except that he mislabels, doesn't label them according to the things that we Receive or the, uh, according to our own expectations, um, he he labels them with things that are metaphorically related to them. So he labels all the rocks with words related to um, to evil, uh, because in in uh, to, to poverty. Sorry, because in Arabic there is a, a saying or a proverb that that links directly poverty to um, uh, to, to to rocks. And mm -hmm. so my question was um, and. The building on an argument that you mentioned in art plus objects, um, that the audience, as you and also as you mentioned right now, are invited to become part of the artwork to do the work of the metaphor. In a sense, mm -hmm. a metaphor is kind of what helps unveil an artwork itself. Um, and that this, as you um, as you've explained, this is what brings up the theatricality of the artwork. Mm -hmm. 
my question then is how, if the audience are called into the work of my nieces, um, how is that not, how is that different from the idea of enchantment that is uh, propelled a little bit by new materialists like Jane Bennett? Um, and what does the audience gain from the experience in which they participate through the metaphor? Right. Um, first of all, I should define how I mean mimesis since it's different from the usual sense. The, the classical sense of mimesis as a theory of art is that you're producing copies of things that exist in nature. Whereas uh, my interpretation of mimesis is that you yourself are becoming the object, as I mentioned in that case of metaphor. So it's like being a method actor where, you know, a method actor is supposed to play a rock. They're becoming the rock. And, you know, um, uh, Marlon Brando showed up for his audition for The Godfather already in character. He probably spent a few days pretending he was Vito Corleone so he could really get in character to, to get that role. Uh, and for on the waterfront, he climbed up a rope over and over again, using only his arms to build up really big muscles in his arms like a, a dock worker would have. So this is method acting, uh, as opposed to the mimesis of, of producing copies, you're becoming a copy. So that's the first thing. And then there's a couple other things going on. Uh, I feel very close to Jane Bennett, even though her philosophy is very different from mine. I admire her writing style. I admire her sense of the importance of non-human objects. Again, the difference is Jane Bennett is more of a monist in the sense that she thinks of the world as a whole, and she thinks of objects as temporary swirls of energy emerging from that whole, which I, I, have, I see objects as more cut off from each other. And also for me, remember, there's a tension between the object and its own qualities, which is not something you find in Bennett's work. That's not a concern of hers. Now, as for this artwork, which I find interesting, there are several different layers here. There are several different tensions going on. Um, first of all, I think this has enough mystery to it that it might have been legible as aesthetics even 200 years ago, um, even though this sort of artwork did not really exist yet. I think 200 years ago, it would have been hard for anyone to see Duchamp's ready mades as art. This one is mysterious enough um, that it might have been legible as art to someone a couple hundred years ago. And then there's several different elements here. First of all, um, some some people who see this won't even know the Arabic alphabet, so they won't even be able to know what these words are. Others like me know the Arabic alphabet, but I didn't know that proverb. Until you explained it to me, I didn't realize there was an association between rocks and poverty in Arabic. I'd never heard that one before. And um, why each set of rocks with each each particular word, why that particular covering with the string. So there's all these tensions going on, making the object uh, mysterious. And it, each of those is already enough to make it a metaphorical experience because a metaphor, remember in the triple O sense has to do with uh, familiar qualities orbiting an unfamiliar object that is not quite literalizable. Whereas I think in Duchamp's case, you have literalizable objects. You have literalized objects like urinals and wine bottle racks and bicycle wheels that are in tension with their context. This again is not a Duchampian work because you actually have a tension between the objects and their qualities. Namely, the rocks are the objects, but they're mysterious because we don't know why they're in the jars. We don't know if they're supposed to represent something. They're in tension with the Arabic words designating them um, that don't have a literal connection with them. First of all, imagine if the artist had simply had a different kind of rock in each jar and the Arabic word was simply the name of that rock in Arabic. Then you'd have that something for that. What's that? That was the first thought, actually. Yeah, he thought of doing that. And then then yeah. you'd have something more like Duchamp or something more like um, Joseph Kosuth's Three Chairs. Uh, but this is something different. The word does not go directly with the object. So it's, it's almost more like Magritte's This Is Not a Pipe mm -hmm. uh, because there's a tension between the word and the, and the object. And so the, the metaphorical effect comes from the fact that the object is mysterious, and yet we're, giving, we're given certain hints and signals from the qualities provided, whether it's the word or the color and shape of the rock or the literal features of the storage jars. And in order to experience this work, we have to perform that mystery in our minds. We have to feel that tension of the, the literal qualities plus the uncertain objects. And so, yes, it is very much like a metaphorical experience. And it's also a mimetic experience in the sense that we are like method actors called upon to uh, enact that mystery. If we if we get bored with this or if it never speaks to us as, as beholders, 
then there's not really an aesthetic effect going on. Effect going on. A critic could just say it's basically just a bunch of rocks and jars with Arabic word, irrelevant Arabic words. That's what a, a sarcastic critic would say. But that means they haven't really gone through the experience of of um, trying to enact that work. I, I talked a bit also in my book about um, uh, Lovecraft about how you can always make fun of something by literalizing it, right? So um, Edmund Wilson, the great American literary critic who hated Lovecraft's fiction, said something like, basically, Lovecraft writes about outlandish creatures who play tricks with space and time, usually somewhere in Massachusetts. And that's supposed to be a way of making fun of Lovecraft. That's a literal description of what his fiction is. But then I went through and showed you can do the same thing for even the, the greatest literature. So Moby Dick, I said, a bipolar one-legged skipper is cruising the world from Nantucket with a team of multi-ethnic harpooners. So there you're literalizing Moby Dick and making fun of it. Yeah, you can always do that, but that's not really a fair description of Moby Dick. Moby Dick's a lot better than that. It's aesthetically a very powerful work. And so a critic always has the option of mocking a work like this, but a, a critic who appreciates the work, as I appreciate this, will say, no, there's actually something here. There's a real sense of mystery here that I can't quite put my finger on. That doesn't mean I can't say anything about it. You know, critics do talk after all, but art critics, when they're good, write more like poets. Um, they don't just literally say in prose terms what this work means. They're using metaphor, they're using ellipsis, they're using rhetoric, they're using figures of speech. And some art critics are habitually better at this than others. Some art critics really can zero in on what's unique about a work and bring it to life. So um, I think there's very much metaphor at play here. There's also another um, another one of his pieces where I think metaphor also plays a role. Um, mm -hmm. This was actually this was inspired by an archival photograph of workers along the Nile, and then um, this is the bathroom as it was found when the artist actually came in, and then he directly kind of matched them together. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're asked as 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 beholders to sort of suspend our disbelief and suspend that this is a broken bathroom and really see it as um, as a fertile land with workers along the Nile. You know what this reminds me of a little bit is it remind, I don't know if you're familiar with Jeffrey Farmer's piece from Documenta about 10 years ago, where he cut out all the people from Life magazine over a 40 year period and put them on popsicle sticks. I think it was all the people and all the objects. Farmer is a Canadian artist. And so you just walk into this room and on both sides of this really long table, there are all these black and white photographs on popsicle sticks. Now, this is a little different because it refers to a real life scene of worker along the Nile. And Garden City, of course, is very close to the Nile. And so in a way, you simply transplanted miniature versions of Egyptian, what, construction workers or maintenance workers a few blocks away into a bathroom, into a, a kind of rubble that somewhat resembles something that Nile workers would be working on. And so in a way, you brought a whole world and transposed it into a different world, but one that has similarities while also miniaturizing them. Um, and uh, I suppose it's interesting to contrast, what if instead of miniaturizing them, you would enlarge them? Like you would put them in a giant warehouse and made them larger than life in a similar situation. What would happen then? Miniaturizing them seems to be, um, what does that do? It makes, I guess you, you could see it as a way of expressing their political uh, powerlessness their economic powerlessness, um, but also it makes them somewhat uh, demonic in a way, I guess. This idea that these these maintenance workers would be these little pixies uh, infesting your bathroom. They're not quite insect-like because they're big enough to be visibly human. So they're not pests, but they're almost like uh, uh, supernatural creatures for being so small. And... Um, uh, it mixes the domestic setting of the bathroom that needs to be repaired with the public works setting of the Nile Riverside. Um, the other thing it makes me think of is, I, I don't want to scare anybody, but I remember when I was living in Egypt, I read an article by a seismologist that Garden City is the neighborhood most at risk if Egypt has another big earthquake. It has to do with soil conditions and 
uh, Garden City might suffer greatly. Uh, so that's another thing that jumped to my mind, but not everybody's going to know that who sees this work, because this looks almost like earthquake rubble that they're working on, uh, although they have shovels, and they, they look to be more at normal uh, labor than at trying to rescue people who are hidden uh, under the rubble. So, um, and of course, now we have in Gaza. In Gaza, we have citizens buried under rubble of buildings. It's another resonance that comes to my mind, one that couldn't have been in the artist's mind when he created this. Uh, but I, I think this is wonderful. Um, these were figures cut out of a photograph? Uh, of no, no, they were specifically made for the show. Uh, they're aluminum painted. They're um, aluminum figurines and then painted on the ah. But They were inspired from actual photos. Mm -hmm. I see, they're aluminum figurines. I couldn't tell that from this image. Uh, so that changes things a little bit. They're three-dimensional. You can wander mm -hmm. around. Okay. You can't really enter the space always because you might crush them, but yeah. Right, so but I'd say this, <laughs> this is a combination of several different aesthetic effects, tra uh, transposing one world onto another and miniaturizing. A uh, couple of different ways of defamiliarizing. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it, it the the... The metaphor still plays a role because this is actually what um, uh, we're, we're we're encouraged to replay that scene in our in our mind. So there's there's the mimetic effect in the sense that you that you explained. Yes, and this this is uh, convincing enough that I can get lost in this for hours. Maybe I could sit here and, and invent a story around this uh, or a film. Um, what kind of strange warped film this would be? But a, a gang of miniaturized Egyptian maintenance workers invade a man's bathroom to do maintenance. That's the, the short description of the film. <laughs> Strange interactions occur. All right. How, what would you do then with the plot of this <laughs> film? I've never quite seen anything like this. So I suppose there must have been an influence behind this, but I, I'm not familiar with any. Gulliver's Travels, right? Where Gulliver travels to one country <laughs> or a small... Um, and another where everyone's large, I guess that's the classic historic example of that. Or The Incredible Shrinking Man, certain science fiction films. But uh, I, I like this. So, um, with with this, the mention of defamiliarization that you were speaking about, I wonder how to think about it in the context of um, a third part of the project, which is the archive. So the... the the, this project is somewhat a triangular relationship between Ahmed Ali Kemal's archive, the apartment itself, but also the artists. Um, and now when it comes to the archive, I'm kind of thinking about the, at, at the end of the art plus objects book, you kind of come into, into a conversation with Hal Foster's um, uh, uh, art, um, um, description of the archival, archival tendency in contemporary art. Um, and I had a question, but I think also Balak had had another had another question related to that. Um, I'll start with mine very briefly. Um, so Malik in her works is interested in um, intervening within the archive um, to sort of see how the latter constantly interrupts itself, and that there's no consistency within the archive. Um, in one of the works, Living Spaces um, of Murmur, Another Man's Flood, she kind of speculates about the content of a damaged film that we could no longer actually see in full. Um, mm -hmm. And she sort of um, she doesn't take it, she doesn't take that for granted, but she takes the damaged parts as a starting point for actually for, for, for making her work, with, which is a projection. Uh, it's a video projection about what she cannot see. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, the question I had in mind was, um, even though archival art has is a more literal approach in terms of mm -hmm. how it considers an artwork or how it's going to produce an artwork, does the speculative character that Malak in introduces into that work sort of rescue the artwork's autonomy? Is it, is it still an artwork that is autonomous enough as opposed mm -hmm. to other archival artists who might be more um, more literal in their in their approach to the archive, even? Though both would seek a sort of subversion of the archive, but still, Malek's, Malek's work still delivers the autonomy of the artwork. Yes, it does. And the way I would put it is to say that nothing is inherently literal. Anything can be deliteralized 
as long as the proper things are done to deliteralize it. So um, the urinal was made deliteralized by Duchamp, obviously. But you, you would never call it deliteralized if you saw it in a restroom. And um, all kinds of things can be done with the archive. Uh, one that I can think of is that um, you know, when, when President Kennedy was assassinated in the United States, there was a famous Warren Commission that was appointed to investigate all aspects of the assassination. And so they produced this multi-volume work with all these details about every aspect of the assassination. It's one of the biggest collections of data, much of it irrelevant, uh, about any historical event ever. And then uh, an artist and writer, Derek Pell, wrote a spinoff book on that called Assassination Rhapsody. And what he did is he sim first of all, he simply took a lot of the sentences from the Warren report out of context and coupled them with strange illustrations. Like there would just be isolated sentences like Oswald resented being in the psychiatric ward or uh, Lee Harvey Oswald hated school. He wished he could have instant chicken pox, these kinds of things. And then uh, there was also a place in the report where they were trying to fight certain speculations. So they would say speculation, colon, then a speculation people made. Like there was more than one sh shooter that killed Kennedy. Commission finding, there was only one shooter. And then Derek Pell would come up with crazy ones, like um, the Texas School Book Depository from where Oswald supposedly shot President Kennedy. Speculation, the Texas School Book Depository is the tallest building in the world. Commission finding, the Texas School Book Depository is five stories tall, a tall building, but certainly not the tallest. So he was he was taking the archive and playing with it, stripping its statements out of context, ridiculing them, uh, making them into a kind of artwork. And that's that's one example of an effective artwork I've seen in relation to an archive. Then if you want to take a step from the archive to the library, you've got Borges' short story, uh, The Library of Babel, which contains all possible random books of a certain length so that these characters are simply wandering the libraries, looking at books, trying to find random sentences of meaning in all these books of gibberish. But I think uh, it's it's quite easy to deliteralize an archive by doing something like this, something like Malik has done. Uh, and so, yes, it's effective. I don't think there's any object that is inherently lit only literal. Any you can do, you can deliteralize anything, but you have to do the work. The fact that anything can be deliteralized does not mean that everything is deliteralized. Literal experience does exist. That's where I disagree with Jacques Derrida. Um, we are surrounded by the literal. The deliteralized is a fairly rare experience. It requires a certain maneuver, a certain gesture. And that's what the artist does. So I think to clarify as well, like the, the way that I try to reconstruct this film that is entirely absent from this projection is by creating a connection between the film and a different report that like the opposite of the film was supposedly uh, like the only access that we have to the contents of the film was some writing on it that says it's, it's about a flood and that happened in 1961. And uh, beyond that, you can't really see it. You can see maybe a few frames in the beginning, but like uh, if you if you stretch out the film too much, it breaks. And so like if you, if you want to actually view the entire film, you, it's completely inaccessible. So awesome. instead, I use like this other report about um, uh, drainage in in a specific part of Egypt in Fayum, and 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 try to find a connection between like flooding and drainage and and and, and that's sort of like a sort of reconstructing a film through a different like piece of document that's completed that's about something else from a different perspective and that's that's I guess what what I was more focusing on the the idea of like the absence of the film but reconstructing it through something else. <laughs> And is, is everyone who sees the film going to see the same thing? So it's inaccessible in the same way for everyone? Well, it is inaccessible in the same way for everyone, but it also moves around space in mm -hmm. specific ways throughout the exhibition. So it depends on what time you can see the film. <laughs> I see. Okay. And then there's there's another sort of case where a film is totally accessible, but no one's going to access it. I'm thinking of Christian Marclay's clock where uh, you know it's a 24-hour film, and I don't know how many people have actually seen all 24 hours. Uh, you kind of, you, you watch it for an hour maybe, and then you get the idea, and you may be impressed, but then you go away and you're, you're 
direct experience of the film is supplemented by this idea that you could watch another 23 hours of it and you have some idea of what it would be inaccessible in a different way from yours. But yeah, you right. certainly succeed in deliterizing here. Uh, it, it's not just an archival film. It actually reminds yeah. me as well of something. <laughs> Sorry? It, it, it reminds me as well of another gesture that El Mojave was constantly introducing in all of his works. Is act, he 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 purposely made them inaccessible in one way or another um, by right. adding that optical parameter. Um, and in one work in particular, we actually we have to constantly move around the mm -hmm. cabinets to, to, to be able to see it, and we can never really see it in full. So it's a drawing that we can't ever see completely as as one entity. In a way. That's fascinating, and and I think in a sense that's built into architecture. Um, that mm -hmm. you can never see all of architecture simultaneously, at least. And so that makes architecture an art that requires memory and kinetic uh, action to experience. And traditionally, visual art didn't have that. Traditionally, you know, a, a sculpture at most, maybe you'd walk around the sculpture and see it from all sides. But artists have begun to explore more the element of time needed to explore an artwork, even if it's not a film or a novel, even if it's simply a, an object of visual art. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's another aspect that artists can capitalize on, making an object difficult to to experience as a whole. I think what I, I like about Mamrovi's work that is fascinating to me is that the cabinet itself. Um, my grandfather used to uh, uh, use it because he couldn't see at the very end of his time, so he had the magnifying lens, uh, to, oh. uh, like to try to use it. So Mamrovi, I think you can talk more about it. How you change the context of the cabinet? Yeah. <clears throat> what was interesting to me, uh, it, it, the device that, that, that he, he used, it was a sort of computer that magnifies things. And I was always fascinated with the idea of repurposing this device. But, but I, I, I couldn't actually get it to work. But, but then I had the idea of, of, of creating um, um, a device that, that, that that has the same sort of function. Mm -hmm. And and to me the idea was um was throughout all my projects was the idea that I'm dealing with the unknown and 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 the idea that you need a medium sort of to 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 see the work or experience the work through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the, this seems like this group project really fits together. Uh, not, only, not only do you have a common space, but there are certain techniques that continue to arise here. And the, I guess maybe the fact that you're all working with a literal living space required you to defamiliarize it in order to aestheticize it. And so that was that's at the forefront of all of these projects, I think. That was actually my, my leading question. My next question was, um, so when we were thinking and putting together the exhibition, the um, one comment that constantly would come about what, was what justifies this exhibition happening in the apartment besides just the fact that this is Ahmed Ali Kamel's apartment. And so in a sense, everything is geared towards making the apartment take the lead in how it, um, it, it forces its, vo its, its, its own voice in, in whether the artist thought about the exhibition or where the curation happened. And in, 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 it, it centralizes the, the uh, or it ushers in the, the apartment as an object itself. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that this is also what helps sort of give some of the artworks their own theatricality. It's because we're literally going into a space that, that and that <laughs> requires some form of an immersion. Um, now, my question here is, given your interest also in, in the relevance of architecture for object-oriented ontology, in what way does the apartment um, serve an exhibition more or better than a white cube space would have? In the sense that a white cube doesn't really allow um, a non-relational artworks. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, um, a white cube is, is more on the literal side than, 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 than this apartment has been. Um, and as opposed to a white cube, can we consider the apartment as what you call an art object in art objects? An art object for you is the fusion between the beholder and, um, and an artwork. 
And I wonder if the apartment becomes, in our case, the art object. It seems like it. Uh, I don't think any of these works could survive in a white cube uh, any more than a human could survive without oxygen. That you've you've drawn on the apartment as an element in all of these works. Um, and as far as architecture, you know, I wrote a follow-up book called Architecture and Objects. And uh, for those who haven't read Art and Objects, or Art Plus Objects, as it says on the cover, um, the point was to try to redefine what formalism means. And uh, what I argued there is that formalism in the Kantian sense and in the sense of Michael Fried means there's not really supposed to be an interaction between the beholder and the work. Those are supposed to be the two separate things. And the beholder's job is simply to stand at a distance and judge using taste as Kant likes. And Michael Fried also in a, in a more contemporary way says something similar. Whereas I was arguing that the, the artwork is necessarily theatrical, the beholder is necessarily involved with it. And also that uh, certain environmental factors might be made to be involved with the artwork that shouldn't be excluded. Um, and the same with socio-political factors. Those don't necessarily need to be excluded. They just need to be minimized and kept finite uh, because you're never going to be interacting with the entirety of a socio-political context or a biographical context. And then what I talked about in Architecture and Objects is I generalized the point and said, you know, Kant rates architecture very low because he says it's contaminated by use. Architecture always has a use, unlike sculpture. And I tried to argue in architecture and objects that there is a way to deliteralize use. And it's it's not new. It's always been known. One way is that um, Aldo Rossi, the great Italian architect and, and writer, architectural theorist, talks about how monuments often had no real functional purpose in architecture, but they organized the space of a city nonetheless. Or especially in a place like Italy, his home country, where you have so many historical buildings that are still used they're being used for different purposes. And so functionalism neglects that many buildings go through multiple different functions in their lifetime. And a building is deeper than any particular function. So for instance, where I teach Southern California Institute of Architecture, we're in a building that was a train station a hundred years ago. And then it became kind of ruins where homeless people were living and then raves were being held in there. And so it's, it, it doesn't have the function of train station anymore, and it might not always have the function of architecture school, but it still has this deep function, which I call extended horizontal movement along a narrow corridor, because the basic deep function of the building is the same. And so it's possible, I think, for architects to create a deep function that isn't tied to any particular function. And um, uh, in a way, you've you've found something similar about this apartment, right? Because you've found different functional dimensions of it to incorporate into each of the artworks, whether it's the ruins in the case of the bathroom, whether it's the kitchen-like functions in the case of the kitchen with the sculpture in there, whether it's the impossibility of the archive uh, in the case of the film, uh, you've all latched onto different features of the architectural object, the apartment, and deliteralized them all. And so in a way, uh, I wonder to what extent I'd be willing to call your project an architectural project as well. Uh, because you've not only created artworks, you have deliteralized the function of the apartment. So in a certain sense, it's an architectural project. You've changed the nature of the space. Yeah. I don't know if that was intended, but... It was constantly about seeing what happens if the apartment takes the lead in the conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. I do have a question about, like, um, so you talk about, so if the urinal is the familiar object, then maybe what is not familiar is the space that the urinal takes, takes place in. So maybe, like, Duchamp's urinal is more of a, an architectural, like, defamiliar, deliteralization than it is, a, like, the object itself. In, in that yeah. sense, or I disagree with it. <laughs> I, I just think that Duchamp's urinal could have been in any number of galleries, right? It wasn't really designed for a specific gallery. So it's yeah. not like he was capitalizing on the features of any specific architectural object. But, but, it, but the institution itself, not the yeah. gallery. Oh, I see. Yeah, the institution, sure. The, the art world, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Although then what happens once that's no longer a surprising gesture like now? Um, it's no longer surprising to put a ready-made somewhere. Uh, 
Um, and then I think I had a, a final question about um, um, about ecology. So um, Ahmed Ali Kamel, as a minister of irrigation, his archive contained uh, a lot of, um, uh, of things related to the environment and the and the ecology at large. And one way it was interpreted into this exhibition was about making the artist's interventions or reconstructions somewhat ecological themselves in the sense that they're not trying to impose um, impose themselves onto the apartment, but rather that in through in their interaction with the apartment, um, they interact through the lens of um, uh, of the ecological. Uh, it was about befriending or listening to the apartment. Um, and in that, that sense, what each artwork does is that it establishes somehow um, it, 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 um, as, a, as, a, as a collaborator that is not actively trying to resist the capacity to, to, to know the apartment as, um, a, a, as a literal uh, apartment, but rather that it, 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 um, it, 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 it makes itself even more open to, um, to the space in which it, in which it exists. And this leads me to the question, does object-oriented ontology aesthetics, is it not inherently in ecological in that sense? Because both in both your aesthetics and ecology would agree on the fact that a, a real non-human being is not there to is not there through its capacity to know as much as it, it exists through its capacity to work to to receive in a way. Right. Um, it would depend on how we define ecology. If the idea is not to make a negative impact on the apartment, but to show some respect for its inherent features, is that what you meant by ecological? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. What would it? What would be? I'm trying to imagine what sort of artwork would be an insult to the apartment. Um, how far would you have to go before it's no longer ecological, before you're no longer showing sufficient respect? Um, I remember going to a hot spring in New Mexico and that there was something kind of mystical about it. We would often go there when we lived in New Mexico. It was this inaccessible area. You had to climb up the side of a hill and sit in the hot spring in the, in the forest at night. And then one day a guy showed up and he had, he brought these cheesy glow sticks, green glow sticks that he had brought from Walmart or something. And he cracked them in half and the light starts. And he said, hey, $1.50 for 12 hours of light. And that's always stuck in my mind as a very insulting uh, uh, kind of behavior towards the, the integrity and dignity of the site. And I've always mm -hmm. wanted to not be that man in any situation in which I was in. Um, my former professor, Alfonso Lingus, writes about the insulting experience of seeing a tourist walk into a temple in Kyoto, Japan, wearing a Walkman, listening to top 40 music as the snow was gently falling on Japan. So it seems like objects um, ask us to be treated a certain way. Yeah. Uh, another, another thing my professor wrote about is it would be wrong. Like if you have, if you, somebody gives you an expensive piece of gourmet chocolate, there's a certain way you have to eat that. It would be wrong to chug that down with a can of Coke even though it's just an you know it's a an animate object and you own the chocolate you can do what you want with it there will be something just wrong about failing to savor the special qualities of that gourmet chocolate so um yeah i think every object projects uh the way that it wants to be treated just as people do and i suppose that's ethical as well as ecological you're also talking about an ethical issue here uh, how should the apartment be treated and um yesterday which we were not, which is not for instance What's that? Which is not which is not something that an artist would consider if they were in a white cube space. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Yeah, you do just about whatever you want in the white cube space. Uh, last night we were talking about Pokemon Go. I was talking about that with some of the students. That game. I, he, apparently, some people still play it. You know, where you're going around and hunting Pokemon monsters, and they were randomly put all around the world. And it, you know, some of them were in concentration camps or inside cemeteries, and it was very offensive to people. And so uh, the company had to, to revise some of its inappropriate placements uh, of these monsters. So, yeah, but I, I think I would certainly say that your group has shown some respect for this apartment. Um, I have even more interest in this building now and in going back to Garden City and wondering about it and 
um, in a way, you had to react with a lot of tact. I, I don't even know how you were allowed to go into this man's apartment uh, after his death. Didn't he have family members who wanted to secure the items in there or what? Um, so he's my grandfather. Oh, so, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you so had I, access that way. I didn't take permission from like my aunts and my father and everyone, but uh, they, of course they didn't understand what they wanted to do with the apartment at the beginning, but they were very open with it. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a question for you. Let, let's say he had not been the irrigation minister. Let's say he were just a random Egyptian. How would the work be different? Uh, we haven't talked about uh, that aspect of it, but the fact that it belonged to a prominent governmental official and also that it was irrigation and not defense or economics, to what extent do those factors play into the work? Um, I think uh, it's, it's a good question, actually. Yeah. Um, I think what we would have still been able to do work, but like what was difficult for us to do was the fact that we had to do work that had to do with the archive and the apartment and how to do to make a, to build the relationship between them both. So I guess we would have done something, but without the archive, like just the apartment. Like I would focus point would would, be, would have been the apartment itself, mm -hmm. or perhaps. Like de depending on who this person would have been, if he's not an irrigation minister, if he was a hobbyist who took photographs, perhaps there's also you know, it depends on like the other dimension of, of whatever objects and documents and photographs and or images he might have left behind. Perhaps our relationship would have been different, would have been defined by that a little bit. But um, in general, it might not have been about irrigation at all. But just the the, the relationship that we come to find between ourselves and the apartment and whatever is left behind, including his objects, including the telephones and <laughs> all his vacuum cleaners and I don't know. Uh, that's, I think, would have would have changed a little bit, but maybe stay. Okay. And also as an artist, like how do we define uh, an important archive rather than like an, an mediocre archive and like how do we use it and how do we change the yeah. context of it? Hmm. So, um so I'm going to step in here really quickly, you guys, as uh, Apex, and just have you look at the time that it's uh, almost half past the hour and to maybe fold in a couple of the very interesting questions that have come through on the chat, um, oh, and then maybe to wrap up uh, a few minutes after that. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the chat? I can open it up. Uh. Oh, I can read the questions also, if that would make it easier. Sure. Um, uh, here's one from uh, someone named James. Wonderful conversation. I do have a question. Understanding triple O as a philosophy of proximate failure or a philosophy of gaps then we might consider art to arrest and form an analog of these conditions. Art, we might say, is proximate failure on our own terms. I wanted to ask what contribution art might make in the critique of computational logic, computation as a closed domain and potentially oppressive domain. There is a renewed salience to the question of technology increasingly as it comes to mediate our lives and cognition. How might we contemplate computation and closed domains through gaps, triple O, and art? Um, my res instinctive response would be that we can, if we can view computational logic in terms of what I call literalism, the idea that you can put everything in a closed system and define everything within that system by its possession of certain qualities or features, uh, the aesthetic is precisely what escapes that, um, making computation impossible. Uh, by the fact that there's always something unliteral, unliteralizable in the object. Uh, however close the various qualities of an object might get us to it, something always slips away. There's something real there that we cannot master, that we cannot compute. And actually, this is an important question when it comes to the high prestige of the natural sciences compared to the arts and the humanities over the last few centuries. Um, no one doubts the social usefulness of science and technology. A lot of people doubt the social usefulness of the arts and humanities. Um, as, as, as powerful as the achievements of science have been, 
uh, even a figure like Bertrand Russell pointed out that science gives us the relational properties of things. It tells us how things can be measured. It tells us how things relate to each other. It doesn't tell us anything about the inherent nature of things. We need a different kind of discourse to do that. We And uh, a non-literal discourse of which art is one, and I would say philosophy is another. Um, there are ways to circle around things and give some hints or indications of what the thing is without literalizing the thing. And as an analogy, it's known that you can't take the globe of the earth and flatten it onto a two-dimensional map. It's mathematically impossible. You have to distort either the size or the shape of the countries on the map. And there are different ways to do that. And it's a political decision as to what how you want to project your map. Well, I'd say the same thing is true for a computation of anything. It's partly political, uh, how you're going to translate a reality into some model that that portrays it. And so the question of politics has come up here for the first time. But what I'm really interested in is the incommensurability between the real and any method of computing or calculating or depicting it. And I think art is a right. one of our excellent ways of reminding us of that. Right. Um, that's such a great answer. Uh, I'm gonna, do you mind if I read another question from, Please. from the audience? Um, this is from um, Suvani, who I think is no longer on the call, but is planning to watch afterwards. Um, the disorientation induced by this reconfiguration of the kitchen, so that was a few, uh, few moments earlier, makes me wonder if triple O could also be thought of as object disoriented ontology. There's actually an article with that title by Alenka Zupancic, who's from Zizek's circle in Slovenia. And it was, a, it was a fairly critical article because the, the Slovenians are interested in Hegel and the calm. I'm also interested in Hegel and the calm, but Hegel is not central for me the way he is for them. And uh, so I think she meant it critically, but I think, yes, uh, the whole point is that objects are disorienting because regardless of what context they're in, an object has an innate conflict with its own qualities. It never quite is equal to its own qualities. This is one of the reasons objects changed. One of the reasons objects have different qualities at different times is that you can never really pin down what the qualities of an object are. And my favorite example of this, I think, is that if I do a thought association experiment here and I say, what's the first, what are the words that come to mind when I say Scandinavians? And most people would say social democracy, gender equality, open to refugees and immigrants, you know, a lot of positive things generally come to mind uh, when I ask people what comes to your mind when I say Scandinavian. But of course, if, if I go back a thousand years, these same Scandinavians are the worst barbarians. They're raping and pillaging. They're burning down cities. They are um, uh, doing all these horrible, they're, they're slaughtering children so that they can guard treasures in the afterlife. Any of these Netflix TV series about Vikings are horrific to watch. They were mean people. And I guess one thing you could say is that there is no such thing as Scandinavian. That's just a word. I would say that there probably is such a thing as Scandinavian that has persisted over a thousand years, but it's deeper than any particular manifestation as positive or negative. Um, I, the United States, my own country, um, right now, you know, we've we got a, a situation where you know we've we got conflict in the Middle East, and the United States is is put itself right in the middle of it. And this reminds people of the United States as being an interventionist military power. Now, uh, if you go back 150 years, it was the opposite. The United States was an isolationist power that never wanted to get involved in foreign countries. So has the country changed? And I would say, no, what's remained the same is a moralism. There's a certain moralism to American foreign policy. And when, if America's staying out, it's because America says it's immoral to get involved in this. And if America's intervening, it's because America feels they're on the morally right side, whether they are or not. So there's this this, ten this tendency to moralize about foreign policy in the American public that I think is a permanent tendency of the country, even if you disagree with the results in this or that case. So a lot of times what we're looking for in the essence of an object is something deeper than any specifically manifested properties. Um, Edward Said is famous for saying in his Orientalism book that you can't generalize about the Orient. And certainly that's true. You can't say Egypt and Japan and India are all the same. That's ridiculous. But I think Said goes a little far. Uh, at one point in his book, Edward Said says, anyway, there's no essence of Egyptian. There's just a bunch of individual Egyptians. 
Well, yes and no. I mean, you don't want to stereotype Egyptians any more than you want to stereotype any individual country. But if you're moving to Egypt for the first time, as I did in the year 2000, there are some things you want to know, right? There are some things that work well in the American context that don't work well in the Egyptian context and vice versa. So for instance, one of my AUC students had a night job telemarketing to the United States from Tahrir Square. And his English was perfect, but he had never been to the United States. And so they made him take an American culture class. And that was fun. I asked him, what did you learn in the American culture class? And he said, they told me when I call Americans to sell stuff, I can't ask them if they're married and I can't ask them their salary. And that made me laugh because that's true. Those are both considered private information in the United States. You'd be creeped out in the United States if, if a telemarketer asked you if you're married or what your salary is. Whereas I don't know how many taxi drivers in Cairo asked me if I was married and asked me my salary. And, you know, one laundry woman, when I said I wasn't married, was trying to set me up with somebody, you know, became a matchmaking thing. So it's just there's those are cultural differences that you need to know. Um, some of them were silly. We were also told I was also told in this piece of writing that if you see a baby in Egypt, you're supposed to say, what an ugly baby, and then wink at the parents to show you're not serious so that the evil eye won't kill the baby. I told that to my students and they laughed out loud and they said, maybe some villages, it's like that, but obviously not in Cairo and educated circles. But the point being, um, you have to know where you are, right? You have to know, you have to read the room or read the country that you're in. Certain things work in certain places and not in others. And so there is something essential about a culture that you have to know to deal with it tactfully. And I think the same thing with, with that apartment. There is an essence to that apartment that you, I think you read successfully. You didn't violate it. And maybe it helped that you had a family member involved um, that made you respect it even more. But I think, I think you were very tactful and ecological in how you responded to this apartment. And I, I could imagine certain artworks that would really desecrate it or would really fail to bring out the spirit of it. And, and you did a great job not doing that. So congratulations. Final question is from our our director, Stephen, who mm -hmm. says, this is great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a plug for us as well. Our open yeah. call is juried from 500 word ideas. No images, resume, or notes from a parent. So some 800 people around the world weighed in on Farida's exhibition and selected it. Uh, but is there an interesting relational conflict in judging a visual show by only the idea? Without seeing anything. Without seeing anything. Um, in a sense, yes, because it's, it's hard to imagine. Usually it's hard to imagine a visual art book with new illustrations. So let's say you got a book about um, Velasquez and there were no reproductions of paintings in it, which simply prose descriptions. And let's say you had never seen a Velasquez painting in your life. That would be kind of strange. I suppose blind people might have an experience like this, um, trying to read in Braille a description of, of visual art. I'm not sure what that's like. This has probably been documented in some cases. Um, so yeah, there's a certain paradox to that. But of course, we're all accustomed to conceptual art now. And so it's not as surprising as it would have been a few centuries ago. And yet, um, the show isn't purely conceptual. Obviously, I, seeing what was done uh, was part of the experience for me. If you had just told me uh, this show is going to be certain installation-like modifications made to an apartment of the man who used to be the irrigation minister of Egypt, that sounds like an interesting project, but I wouldn't have had as much to say about it uh, even if you had described to me what would what was done with the individual pieces. So the actually seeing the pieces definitely adds something. You know, to, to turn to philosophy again, there's this famous philosophy thought experiment called the myth of Mary that probably none of you have heard of, but it's famous in philosophy. And that thought experiment is there's this uh, hypothetical neuroscientist named Mary, and she knows everything there is to know about the human brain. She has perfect knowledge of the human brain and how it works. For some strange reason, she was born underground in a room that only has black and white objects and no color. So she's never seen a color in her life. And yet she has she's the world's greatest neuroscientist and knows everything about how the brain works. So then the thought experiment is that you, you finally show her some colored objects. Question is, does she learn anything or not? And I would say, of course, she learned something. 
right? She's seen colors for the first time. But there are quite a few philosophers who say, no, she's not learning anything because she already had all the perfect knowledge of how the brain works and what the chemical signals in the nervous system, how those correlate with colors, and that's all she needs to know. And there are various nuanced positions. I'm definitely on the side of those who think Mary learned something by seeing the colors. My own version of this is that, you know, when I was in Cairo, uh, two of the best things about Cairo were cheap flights and proximity to lots of different countries. You know, for the United States, everything is so far away. Everything's very expensive. Um, in Egypt, you're close to what well, you can go to India for a few hundred dollars. You can go to uh, Syria and Jordan for a few hundred dollars. There's so many places you can go. Even Japan wasn't that expensive. Europe wasn't that expensive. So I traveled a lot when I was in Cairo. And I would get in the habit of reading Lonely Planet travel guides, every single word of them before I'd go to the country. And yet I was always surprised. There was something not quite right about each of the guides, even the ones that were expertly written. Uh, and part of that is because I have my own way of traveling. For some people, traveling is about visual scenes and they tend to photograph a lot. For me, travel is more about finding the the connections between parts of a city. What are the shortcuts? What are the routes? What's it like to walk in a place? What it smells like? And so, for instance, a powerful experience for me was the old city of Damascus. I was in Syria long before the Civil War. It was rare for Americans to go, but it was it was a very interesting experience for me. Not many Americans go to Syria. Even then, not many went. And, you know, I, I very powerful spatial experience in the old city of Damascus. Uh, the fact that it was small and walled in so you could get lost and it didn't matter. Whereas if you get lost in the Khan al-Khalili, you might really get lost. You might end up in some place and not find your way out for many hours. You knew in Damascus that wouldn't happen. Uh, and there's the kind of a small stream running through the old city. Uh, there's a steam bath. There's the world's best candy I've ever found is in the Damascus old city. Uh, so that was very powerful. Me, the strangeness of the place and the inaccessibility of the place for Americans at the time. You know, it wasn't wasn't the easiest experience getting the visa. Anyway, these are all things I had to experience in person. I, I guess I'm a kinetic traveler. I like to know what it feels like to move through a place. And even if I were a visual traveler like my wife, who likes to photograph everything, um, which that that creates a tension between us because she's always wanting to stop. And photograph things whereas for me constant movement is what i want i want to be have uninterrupted uh physical movement through a place um you can't get those from a travel book prose does not do it in a more than trivial sense and smells of course are hard to depict in in prose so that's that's another example i think of of the way just the idea of a thing can't quite do it justice although ultimately the sensual experience of a place doesn't do it justice either I think the object is not just deeper than words. The object is also deeper than our experience of it. So hope that's helpful. Well, thank you all so much. It's been such a great conversation between uh, Professor Harmon and Farida and also the artists who I, I didn't realize that they were coming. So it's been this kind of bonus to be hearing all of you talk together. And um, also, so I feel like it's, the apartment and the, um, oh, I've got another, okay. Someone just saying thank you. <laughs> um, I, I I feel like this exhibit is so much about sort of the relation, you know, the archive, but then kind of having it con context is such an active question um, in this exhibit. Context is leading rather than being this kind of added on Thing. And so it's it's also um, quite beautiful to hear you guys sort of speak from the shared context of Cairo. And even though you're talking about these very, abs in some ways abstract, but very lucid ideas, um, there's a way where I sense a sort of the sharedness also feels specific and like it's, it's influencing. Um, it, there's sort of shared influences that I is, is sort of wonderful to behold from the outside. This reminded um, me of how much I love smart and interesting young Egyptians who were a big part of my life for 16 years. And I missed that. And if I were there, we could have a great conversation. I'd take them all out to dinner and we'd, we'd speculate about stuff. And as far as I, I see Paul is asking if I'm working on anything new, maybe I should just answer that. Yes, very chat. quickly. And then we'll, we'll call it a day. 
Yeah, at some point I'll write more about art. Um, I've got so many interests that I, I get distracted with other projects for a while and circle back to things. Uh, actually, the big project I'm working on now is with, uh, I recently published this book, Objects Untimely, with Christopher Whitmore, who's an archaeologist. We're doing a bigger book together called Anthropoiesis, which is a kind of anthropology and archaeology project and how it relates to philosophy. We're going to talk about the creation of the human. And our basic thesis is that a lot of anthropologists talk about tools as externalizations of the human body, so that a hammer is like an extension of the hand. We're going to go in reverse and talk about human development as an internalization of external objects. And our inspiration there is Lynn Margulis, the great evolutionary biologist who thinks evolution happened by symbiosis between independent organisms. So, for example, that a human cell originated by a virus coming in as a parasite and then becoming an important part of the cell, a permanent part of the cell, so that our cells are no longer just human cells. They're symbioses with bacteria. And, and viruses that we've incorporated into our body. Uh, and we're going to apply that to anthropological examples. So it's a pretty ambitious project, but we, we're very excited about it. And uh, art will play a role in that. And I will be coming back to write more on arts and architecture in the future. So. Well, very Thank exciting. You. Sure. Thank you. All right. Very kind of Thank you very much. Wonderful I enjoyed conversation. this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, right. Professor Harmon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.